Okay, so I want to start by asking a question that I'm sure is foremost on everybody's mind. Websites is two words? <laughs> so th that's actually a funny story. I love telling stories. So, uh, you know, O'Reilly looks at various sources. The, um, what is it, the Chicago newspaper has a style guide? By the Chicago manual style. Yeah. Um, and when I wrote the first book in 2006, 2007, you could go either way. Um, and I was just used to using two words. In 2009, when this one came out, the style guide said it's one word. And O'Reilly said, you know, I said, oh, and here's the name of the book, Even Faster Websites, with two words. And they said, well, yeah, except we're going to make that one word. That's our style guide now. And I said, no, you can't do that because I can't live with a discrepancy like that <laughs> where I've got two books and they spell websites differently. I said, and they said, all right, your book is the last book that will let websites be two words. So uh, I think there's a moral in that, that particularly in the web, but in, in the world, in life, things change, right? Um, and sometimes change is good, sometimes change is bad, sometimes things don't change and we're stuck with stuff. Like, um, you know, it was heartbreaking, the, the story you were telling, but it's not a new story. It, it comes from a mistake that Brendan Eich made in 1995 where he added document.write to the primitive DOM API, which I hope will be the worst mistake he ever makes. But he made it, and we have known that was a mistake for a long, long time, and we have made no progress in fixing it. Um, and you know, so we, and we keep rediscovering it, and, and it's bad. And we can't get rid of it at this point because the advertising industry adopted it. Right. At, decade or so ago. And so if we fix document.write, the ad network fails, and then there's no money in the web, and, and that's the end of that. So solving this is going to be really hard. But uh, does it solely rest on the shoulders of document.write? Couldn't you, uh, in that ad code or something else, say, um, you know, let me find uh, the current script that I'm in, and let me uh, insert a DOM, a div, or something like that, right above or right below the script, because I know the script is where I want this ad to occur. And so it seems like, and I think that that would cause the same sort of problems. That that um, even if you did that asynchronously, the browser would have charged ahead, and then you, um, oh no, because it's not doing document dot right. Yeah, yeah, you're doing DOM. Yeah. So, the thing I like you're about, absolutely right. The, the thing I like about your approach is that it's really pragmatic. Uh, whereas I'm, 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 I tend to be more theoretical. I, I want to find what is fundamentally wrong and fundamentally fix it. Whereas you look at what we actually have and what is actually achievable. You know, since you're not expecting that you can fix the browser, you're going to try to fix it on the application side. Um, and so you've come up with rules and conventions which allow you to work around that stuff. Yeah. Theoretically, um, you're right. Well, of course I'm right. <laughs> um, but you also get this thing where you get two steps forward and one step back, where good practices next season turn out to be bad practices. You know, like uh, you recommended domain sharding because the browsers had this stupid limitation of only two connections per host, and so that throttled how much data you could load at once. And so you said, well, let's just fan it over several domains. And that was great until the browsers fixed the connection limit. And now sharding actually slows things down because you're doing more DNS and, and it can't cache as effectively. In some cases. So, um, you know, then, you know, we're doing a lot of lazy loading stuff now. But it makes me uncomfortable because it's way too much work to be lazy. You know, lazy patterns should be less work, not more work. And we're working really hard. And now Google is reporting that there are performance problems in that, and that um, they want to be able to mouse over a link. And just by hovering, they want to start loading the HTML and all the, the scripts. But they can't load all the scripts because they can't see all the scripts. The scripts won't be visible until the first scripts run. So we would. Um, 
there's no right way. There's not a good answer, and I find it really frustrating. And um, what's hard is if you're doing the right thing, which is like really staying up to date, uh, using the latest best practices, then you're having to do more work than the people who like really have no idea what's going on. Um, but the other side of that is hopefully, uh, one, you're developing your craft. You're, you know, even if you have to change things and put something in and take a step back, um, you're learning more about how things work and hopefully understanding why you do that. But then also by putting in that extra effort, um, in that time between when it was two steps forward or one step back, you know, it might have been a year or two year time period, it's true that you had to undo that work you did two years ago, but in that two year period, hopefully you had a, a better site, you know, better user experience or whatever it is. So, you know, there are benefits to it, but yeah, I, I know you and I have talked a lot about that, about how a lot of these hacks are things that people are going to have to unlearn. And that's, that's really unfortunate. And to me, um, you know, maybe that's one of the reasons in the HTTP archive you'll see um, that these, a lot of these performance best practices have a high adoption rate in the top 1,000 websites. But as you get closer to the tail, uh, these best, the adoption of these best practices drop off a lot. And so it might be that the people who are really paying attention to this stuff and putting in that extra effort even if they might have to undo it later, are the, excuse me, the companies that have um, dozens, if not hundreds, of developers. And so they can afford some of that busy work of put in, take out, put in, take out, put in, revise, revise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you really have to keep on top of it. And unlearning is really hard. You know, you still see reflections of Dreamweaver in, in the scripts we look at. You know, and that stuff was done a long time ago before anybody had any idea of how programming worked. And it's still copied. And, and so someone will say, well, well, that's the right way to do it without any evidence for why that is, or, or the evidence has since expired. Um, but it's still out there. And we spent a lot of time trying to educate our community, but even so, it, it is a struggle. You'll see. Yeah, another <clears throat> example of that that you see every day is uh, like Business Insider fixed their Twitter snippet, but um, even though it was causing you know anyone in China to see a blank page for 20 seconds, um, they might not have fixed it. Like I don't know if they fixed it because I I had them as my counter example in this presentation, but a lot of times you'll see these antiquated patterns. The same is true with Google Analytics. We've had the async pattern out for two years now, and you know, still a large number of sites are using the synchronous pattern. So unless something fails in a very noticeable way, people don't go back and revisit work that they've already done. Mm -hmm. They've done it, they've finished it, it's behind them, and they don't want to go back and look at it unless there's some kind of catastrophe or emergency around it. So you've demonstrated tonight that uh, if you don't attend to performance, it can get so bad that it turns into unreliability and then into failure. But it's even worse than that. Um, because of our dependence on third-party scripts, the security implications of that are, are completely horrendous. Um, you know, and it, if you're Facebook, maybe it's not that much of a problem because all you do is waste people's time. And so, you know, if you know, there are lots of ways to waste people's time, right? And you know, one's as good as another, maybe. Um, but you know, where I work, we're, we're trying to move money through the network. And if any of that stuff goes wrong, the consequences are a whole lot worse than wasting time. Yeah. And right now, the browser is not a safe platform for doing that stuff. And I despair sometimes, you know, how do we get it fixed? Yeah. I, I've never written about this before, but years and years and years ago, I formed I tried to figure out where performance fit into the grand scheme of things. And I only got, I stopped once I got to performance, but it turned out in my mind it's number four. I didn't think about five and lower. But to me, the priorities are availability. If the site's not up, then it doesn't matter you know, how fast or you know, performant it is. Um, 
The next is security and privacy. If you're not protecting your users and their information, then that can be disastrous, you know, even you know, to the point of legal ramifications, certainly financial ramifications and brand uh, ramifications. Third is functionality. If it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, if you can't view a page or, you know, look at someone's profile, then, you know, people aren't going to use it. And really the fourth one is performance. You know, if, if the features don't work, users are scared to use it, or the site's not even available, it doesn't matter how fast it is. But, you know, 10 years ago, I know, you know, I was at big companies that dealt with availability, like just trying to stay up. The number of users was growing so fast, and we didn't know a lot about security back then. And, you know, staying on top of bugs, that's always a constant battle, but usually functionality is pretty good. And, you know, certainly I think for the last five years or so, most companies are have been on top of those, what I consider higher priorities, uh, enough to start paying attention to performance. But I completely agree with you. I, I want websites to be really fast, but it's even more important to protect users and, and their money and security. I didn't get the part of the self-updating script. So is it mainly for the third-party sites? Uh, it's not for the your own scripts, right? Because you can update your own script using injecting, changing the path of the yeah. JavaScript. Yeah. The whole, it's a lot, it's really hard to set up that problem. But the setup is, I'm a third party, and I, I can't change the code that's in your website, so I have to give you this snippet, and it can never change. And that snippet includes a URL, so it means I can never change that URL. And since I can never change the URL, but I want you to get changes, I want users to get changes, I make it expire after 15 minutes. And, and because the browser, the user has to keep requesting it so many times throughout the day, and there's a, I don't know what, one in a thousand chance that it could take 15 seconds to download. We're just increasing that probability of this front end spoff problem. But you're right, the only reason that I um, have to rely on expiration date to get updates to the user is because I can't modify that code in someone else's page. If it's my page, I can just make it uh, mycombo1.js, mycombo2.js, mycombo3.js. So you're absolutely right. It's only for third-party um, snippets, third-party uh, uh, scripts. Uh, the another kind of workaround is if you're managing those scripts that are injected from the server side, you can maintain the versions in the server side and then put the latest version of the script that is going to be injected from the server side itself, right? I'm just saying as a workaround. If we are not following this approach, the self-updating scripts, yeah. we can maintain the versions in the, the server side and then inject the actual version to frame the URLs for the third-party scripts and then update it. Well, how? what would be the version for... In the sense, like, um, all the scripts, the third-party scripts you'd be inserting from your server side pages, like a JSP or any other PHP pages. Yeah. So you'd be maintaining that script that needs to be injected to the HTML page. In that case, so you maintain all the URLs that needs to be injected. So we can actually directly go and change the configuration. Like instead of injecting version 1.7, inject version yeah. 1.8. Right. That would be a possible approach on your on your back end. You could like be pinging, have a cron job that is constantly pinging APIs.google.com and Facebook and Google Analytics and always detecting as soon as there's a change and then doing something to twiddle your page. You could do that, yeah. 